okay, will be recorded. And while, um, um, if when you're not talking, please keep your computer muted. And what we're gonna do is, um, uh, I'm gonna, I'll give a brief introduction here in a few minutes, but uh, just to let you know the format for those of you that are new, um, Brian will, um, uh, Brandon, excuse me, Brandon will give a, uh, uh, pre give his short presentation. We've given him a list of about eight or nine questions uh, we, that we'd like for him to specifically address. And then we'll open it up at, uh, for the discussion um, where everyone can ask any questions they might have of him. Um, during that time, what we would ask that you do is, um, uh, again, stay muted. Um, and then if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll see it on the screen and then we'll call on you. Um, and then you can ask your question or what have you. So um, a lot of times devoted to just, again, uh, uh, questions uh, that you might have later on. So anyway, let me go ahead and get, get started. Um, uh, Brandon, again, uh, thanks a lot for participating in uh, our rare uh, open discussion session. We appreciate you taking the time um, doing this um, and uh, read, reading your, uh, your bio. Um, uh, very, very impressed. Oh, wow. uh, very, very impressed with uh, uh, with what you've done so far um, as a young person. We're all old, Brandon. We're, we're old <laughs> on the screen here, but uh, right. we're, age ain't nothing but a number, right? <laughs> yeah, we're we're impressed with what you've uh, achieved so far. And what really uh, sticks out for me more than anything else is the fact that um, you're a person that, uh, being a school teacher. Um, uh, and with your, your background in, um, um, in the community, uh, you're a person that really know firsthand a lot of the issues that are the challenges specifically as it relates to uh, racial equity uh, that we're talking about. Uh, you know about them firsthand, uh, you've experienced them. And so you uh, uh, probably more so than any of the other uh, board members uh, can uh, bring a uh, sense of reality and truth uh, to um, uh, helping to address the, the opportunities and challenges that we have with the uh, racial equity. For those of you that um, don't know, uh, Brandon, uh, again, Brandon Hershey is the uh, Seattle, school, uh, Seattle School Board member representative for uh, District 7, which is the uh, Southeast Seattle area and so forth on that. Uh, but again, um, Brandon, we appreciate um, you taking the time out and everything. And one thing I, I think, I, I don't think I realized, but um, being a member of the school board is an unpaid position. Yes. Is that right? <laughs> it is. It's, it's, it's unpaid. So you're like, you're like those of us on rare. We don't get paid for this either. Uh -huh. We just love what we're doing and we're committed to what we're doing, right? Hey, board leadership. Board leadership. That's what it takes. That's what it All takes. right. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, before I uh, turn it over to you, uh, uh, Brandon. I'm going to turn it over to Tony to see if he has anything that he'd like to say uh, uh, to the group here. So, Tony. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Uh, hi, Brandon. Thanks a lot for coming today. Being a teacher and a, uh, being on the school board are two kind of almost full time jobs at once, and you still found time to come and spend an evening with us. So, Greatly appreciated and looking forward to hearing from you. And I also wanted to, uh, besides all the steering committee, hi, steering committee. It's always good to see you guys every few weeks. And um, we've got uh, 23 people on our steering committee, Brandon, and, and most of them are here tonight. And the ones that aren't, they'll get a recording of this to see. And also to the visitors who are here tonight, including I see uh, Christina, the principal of Roosevelt's here with us. That's great. And um, Several others, we love to see new faces here. The more the better, and please um, spread the word. Once a month, we have this open discussion. So uh, we really invite anyone who's interested in Rare and Roosevelt High School to uh, come and, and, uh, and then contact us later if you wanna get involved in some way uh, in the Rare structure, because we're, we're looking for more people, particularly younger people, but we'll take, we'll take any age. So, uh, and the pay is really good, like Joe said. So, uh, in fact, we're thinking about doubling the salary pretty soon here. But. Anyway, um, again, welcome, Brandon, and that's all I've got to say, Joe. Thanks. You're muted, Joe. Yep. Okay, Brandon, it's all yours. Right on. Okay. Well, <clears throat> good evening. So 
what would be helpful? Give me just a moment. I'm going to, so would it be better to throw up the questions after I do a quick introduction? So, fe- so folks can like see what we're talking about. Would that be possible? Sure. Okay. Right on. So I'll do my little introduction and then we'll get to it. So, hi, my name is Brandon Hersey, like the candy bar without the second H. I'm the vice president of the Seattle school board representing Southeast Seattle. Uh, I also teach second grade during the day. Um, I come to you from the great state of Mississippi. My mother, my grandmother, and my sister are all educators. My mother, before she passed away, taught for 21 years at our local high school, AP Government and Civics. And my sister is currently a vice principal at that high school, Hattiesburg High, go Tigers. Uh, Immediately after graduating from the University of Southern Mississippi, after being named the university's first African-American Truman Scholar, I accepted a position with the Obama administration, but to be more specific, the Department of Health and Human Services under the Obama administration, uh, working in policy around TANF and social safety net efforts within the federal government. And what I really found out from working in that administration specifically, thinking that, you know, here I was a young black man ready to get it done going into DC after living my entire life in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I thought going to the Obama administration, I was going to be surrounded with all these, you know, incredibly intelligent people of color and women who were working deeply in policy. And my boss was a white man who had been there since Reagan. And so really what I found out very quickly is that the federal government is not where it's at in terms of getting change done. And so much to the dismay of my family, I decided to follow in all their footsteps and become a teacher. Uh, My fiance, Elizabeth, is who brought me out here. She uh, is originally from Stanwood, Washington. She's a doctor. She just finished uh, medical school at the University of Washington where she received a full ride and is now a psychiatrist uh, completing her residency here in Seattle. So we're very proud of her. I'm a resident of Rainier Beach. We just bought a home in a ridiculous market. And I am just really excited to be here talking with y'all. I'm also running for re-election. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I succeeded former director Betty Patu um, and have been serving on the Seattle School Board for two years in which we have gotten a ton done. One of the most notable things that I'm really excited about is our new leadership under that of Dr. Brent Jones, who some of y'all might be familiar with. So that's enough about me. Thank you so much for having me again. I'm ready to start digging into some of these questions. And I'm gonna be real with you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I'm going to tell you exactly how I feel. And so if you are down for getting into these deep conversations, that's what it needs to be. Because uh, from the perspective of a black man from Mississippi, we got some work that we need to do here in Seattle more so than a lot of other places. So I'm excited to have those conversations. Okay. I I think what I'll do, Brandy, rather than put it up on the screen, um, which will stop uh, people from seeing each other, I'll just read it. Okay. So um, the first question Mm -hmm. um, is, what is the current racial environment opportunities in the Seattle schools, in Seattle schools, from your perspective? Are the opportunities the same with predominantly black schools versus white schools? Yeah, so let's talk about the systemic barriers that keep that question from from really being answerable in in a specific way. So as a teacher and as a policy analyst, I know that when we are talking about what opportunities are available at schools, we have to think of a few different questions, right? We have to think about who's offering those opportunities. We have to think about what do those opportunities look like across the system? And then we also have to think about is where are those opportunities actually available, right? And we only in the school district, and this is not just in Seattle, this is across many school districts. We only often think about that last one, where are the opportunities available? And we never really think about what is the follow-up to make sure that those opportunities are being delivered by people that look like our students or are those opportunities actually effective? So let me paint a picture for you, right? When we're talking about what things are available in buildings, we have to think about what is the expertise and staff in those buildings. And what we know is that teachers who have been teaching in our district for a long time typically are more concentrated in the north end of the city versus the south end where we have younger, less experienced teachers. Now that comes with a caveat, right? because nine times out of 10, the teachers who have been with us for a long time do not necessarily have the same cultural competencies as the teachers that are going through more progressive uh, training programs and coming into our system. And so when we have the conversation about who is delivering what to our students, we have to systemically take a look at, okay, we have a lot of our expertise in our buildings that are concentrated in a very specific part of the city versus we have new teachers in the south end of the city where we have high populations of African-American students and other uh, black and brown students. And so we really need to make sure that for those buildings, it's not necessarily just a game of like, okay, well, let's send all the experienced teachers or like, let's break that up. That's not necessarily it. 
What we know that we need to do is in our buildings where we have high populations of African-American boys and other black and brown students with teachers who are less, less experienced, we are providing more in the way of supports in other areas, right? Making sure that when we have those new teachers that they're not suffering from burnout because they have a higher caseload because they are dealing with more uh, crowded classes or a different demographic, you know what I'm saying? And what we know also from data is that black and brown teachers, especially new ones, burn out within the first three to five years, as opposed to our white counterparts who typically burn out within the first seven to 10 if they're gonna leave the profession. And so what that tells me is that we need to be building in supports to make sure that the teachers that we do have, especially in our South End schools, especially in <clears throat> for our students who look, excuse me, for our teachers who look like our students, we need to be very strategic, especially in those first three to five years to ensure that we're not only recruiting these folks, but we're retaining them also. And so that's just a small, small glimpse into how we have to think about these problems. So to actually answer your question, no. The ed educational opportunities that take place in this city are very scattered. Now that's not to say that there aren't some amazing things that are focused on equity going on in the North End or that there aren't any inequities going on in the South End. But what we do need to figure out is that if we're going to be serious about our strategic plan, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, we need to figure out how are we measuring those outcomes? How are we holding the system accountable to ensuring that those opportunities, regardless of where our students go to school in this city, are equitable across the board? Okay. All right, uh, second question. Um, what is your perspective on critical race theory yeah. and project 1619? Yeah, I think it's the truth. I think that's what we need to be teaching our children, right? And what I really think that, again, <clears throat> our focus in all of K-12, in my opinion, and I, and I don't get it twisted, I'm only 29. And so, but I have seen a very diverse array of public school systems. And I think we're all getting it wrong here. There is such a focus on what ethnic studies specifically and anti-racist pro-black curricula, any type of culturally competent curriculum. There's such a big focus on high school. We're always trying to make new high school classes because we think that kids K-5 can't adequately engage with that type of material. And we know that that's not true. The science tells us that children notice differences in skin tones as early as three to four years old. And they start noticing racial contract, excuse me, racial constructs as early as five to six. And so what I think that we need to focus on, especially in terms of critical race theory, and especially in terms of supporting initiatives like the 1619 project is ensuring that we're equipping our students to have conversations and be able to articulate how they identify and what that means to them and how to celebrate it from a very early age, right? Because I know firsthand when I, I was start, I began teaching second grade in federal way in 2016. The year that Trump got elected was my first year teaching school. And I had kids that came in the next day and for the rest of the year. And even to this day that asked me very deep and pressing questions about the state of our country and how are we actually making things fair for everyone, right? What I want folks to know is that kids today, it's not like when I was growing up in the 90s. If you told me that Santa Claus was real, I probably believed you. If I tell an eight-year-old right now that Santa Claus is real, they're gonna go Google it and find out that that's not the case. And so what we need to make sure that we're doing is as a society, we're pivoting to making sure because we don't have any control over it. It's a, it's a lost cause. All of our students have cell phones. All of our students have access to the internet, which also means that they have access to the truth. So we are not doing our jobs adequately if we are not engaging with them and telling them the truth. Now there's ways to do that in a developmentally appropriate way, but that doesn't mean that if we can't figure out how to do that, that that excuses us from the act in the first place. So I believe strongly that the school district needs to take an active role, not only in making sure that we are telling our children the truth about our country, but we are also equipping them to ask good questions and demand better. Because if we don't, if we're not giving them the tools necessary to articulate those types of understandings, then we're doing a poor job of actually trying to close the opportunity gap in the interest of social and racial justice. Okay, uh, Brandon, for, for those, uh, I'm sure most of the folks on this um, call here are familiar with the critical uh, race theory um, in Project 19, but can you give them just kind of a yeah, summary sure. of what it's all about? Yeah, so Project 1619 was started in 2019, uh, remarking the first, 1619 was the first year documented that we know uh, when slaves arrived in this country that were brought over from um, 
Western Africa. Um, and so the curricula around that is basically challenging the, the history books and the understanding of how did um, African Americans come to this country, the atrocities of slavery. There's a great graph that I would love to show that puts into context just like how long uh, we as a people in this country have been quote unquote free. And, it's, and when you look at that arc, it's not, it's not, very, it's not very long. And so critical race theory is actually the, the idea of being critical about racial constructs that exist within our society. And if you follow the teachings of Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, who wrote the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, you would know that there is nothing in this society that is not racist. It is either racist or it is anti-racist. And that's specifically around policy and social constructs. So when I am making my decisions as a board director, I try to follow the teachings of these scholars, especially in present day, because it is that type of critical race analysis that we have to apply to all of our decisions. And it's how we actually get to this ideal of targeted universalism, which means that our whole system has to be committed to this singular goal of supporting black boys and their families within our system. And if we can't do that, then we're gonna be very far away from the mark. But that's kind of like a little synopsis of how, what my understanding of critical race theory in the 1619 project is and how we implement it here in Seattle. Great. Um, next question. Okay, what programs uh, is the Seattle School Board currently implementing or planning to implement to address mm -hmm. racial equity opportunities? Yeah, absolutely. So again, as a teacher, what I'm going to tell you is that if we're talking about finding racially equitable opportunities for our students and narrowing the opportunity gap, it's got to take a in the classroom and out of the classroom approach, right? And this is another place where I think a lot of districts can do a lot more. The reason that I say that is because the opportunity gap doesn't just exist in schools. As we just talked about, as Dr. Kendi teaches, everything is the opportunity gap. It exists in the way that our students walk down the street, when they walk into a school, when they walk into a store, when they walk anywhere, right? And so to think that we're going to be able to close the opportunity gap just with curriculum is short-sighted. What we have to also do is make sure that we are reducing barriers to, to access uh, stable lives for our children at the same time outside of the classroom and doing that in a couple of ways. The first one, under the leadership of uh, then President DeWolf, um, is our student community workforce agreement. And I'm really excited about this. As a union member and a proud union member at that, a student community workforce agreement essentially says, for example, we're rebuilding the uh, Rainier Beach High School in my district down on the South End. What that community workforce agreement says is that students and their families who live in that area have first priority when apprenticeships and jobs to work on those contracts come up. That's important for a couple of reasons. The first one is that it keeps dollars in the community because what the last thing we want to happen is for when y'all pass a levy and everybody's property taxes go up, we're giving all of that funding to some foreign company that's coming in to build a school. I wanna make sure that as much as possible, we are making sure that those dollars stay in community. And that's gonna be true for any school that is being built throughout the city. So just like if you know we had um, Roosevelt High School being rebuilt, those same opportunities would be available to students who live in that area as well. The critical piece about that again though, is making sure that we are also providing opportunities for resource allocation and stability outside of the classroom. Because we know that we have many high schoolers that are not only working to support their families, but also taking care of brother and sister and trying to make sure that they are maintaining academic excellence. Think about how easier it would, excuse me, how much easier it would be for a student not to have to worry about the job that they have because they know that it's already provided for them and they are going to have a pathway to a living wage after high school, right? Because when you think about it, I'm teaching in a federal way. Many of my students are not federal way, uh, federal way residents. They're actually former South Seattle residents that have been priced out because their families could not afford to live in the city anymore. And so what that tells me is that we are not preparing our children to have the choice to live in the city where they grew up. And if we're not doing that, then we need to be figuring out what are we going to do in terms of partnering with all these other agencies, government partners, what have you, to make sure that we are doing our part in terms of resource allocation. So that's just one way that I personally think about how do we, how do we expand racial equity opportunities? Because it really has to be about direct resources. Because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of people making new programs, new mentorship, new this, new that. That's all fine and good. 
But unless we have a, a system where no kid is showing up to school hungry, that everybody has the resources that they need, those are the types of things that we have to tackle first. Because all of that extra, that's not gonna have as much of an impact if we're not taking care of basic needs primarily. And so we have to be able to do both. We have to be able to make sure that we're taking care of um, basic needs, but we also need to make sure that we have robust opportunities throughout our entire system to offer to our students. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> over the, the last three years, uh, Seattle uh, Public Schools has lost a number of black educators, mainly black males. Uh, what happened? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that could explain what happened. And then I also kind of want to reject that narrative a little bit. I don't know where the data is coming from from that, but we're actually recruiting more black males than we ever have. And I want to point specifically to the Academy for Rising Educators, where the majority of the incoming class is identified as a person of color or, and I think if, if I'm not mistaken, about 30% of those um, new incoming teachers are, are identifying as black. And so what I just want to say is that, yes, we have a problem with retaining black males for a number of reasons, but let's, let's be real. It's A, the racist construct that is a school system, but then also B, this job don't pay. Like, let's be real. <laughs> I am a professional. I am a school board director. And before I bought my home, I had to take advantage of an MFTE, which is basically rent control for the city of Seattle. So my thing is before we even talk about bringing more black males into this system, before we start recruiting more people of color, especially from out of state, if we're trying to do that to come here, we need to make sure that they can afford it. You know what I'm saying? And that's largely coming from the legislature. And so what we need to do to make sure again that we are retaining these folks is that we need to fully fund public education. <laughs> and like, we need to actually pay teachers a living wage. And one thing that we have seen is that especially over the course of the pandemic, for many educators and for many of our students, schools were, was the first and only interaction with the public social safety net. Many of our uh, students were coming to our schools getting food. Many of our students were depending on their teachers for so much, and yet we're paying them pennies on the dollar. And this is all after the historic salary increases that just happened about 18 months ago. I'll be real with you. When I first moved here from working for the Obama administration, y'all know as a young man, government jobs don't pay great. But moving here as an educator, I took a $20,000 pay cut to come here and teach. That's not sustainable. And so before we have, you know, all these conversations, how do we get more black teachers? How do we do this? How do we do that? We got to make sure that these jobs are worth it. And it's not just about the pay. It's also about the environment. And that is on all of us as a system and as a city. Because I'm telling you, I'm from Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and I have experienced more racism here in Seattle than I ever did growing up in Mississippi. So I'm, I, th th those are the conversations that we need to be having. You know what I'm saying? Yes, we need more black teachers. Don't get me wrong. We need to be recruiting more teachers that look like our babies. But I'm not trying to bring nobody into a situation to where they are going to be oppressed and not make any money to the point to where they're gonna burn out and leave the field altogether. So I think the conversation is just kind of bigger than what we've been having in the past. And these are the types of conversations in spaces like this where I think y'all could be helpful, right? And where I really want, where I would say the call to action for me to y'all is, is to continue to engage with us in a way to see how can groups like this support the aim and the ideals of making sure that teachers are taken care of because we could really use your help advocating in the legislature. You're still on mute, brother. Okay, uh, next question. Okay, what is the um, Seattle School District's disciplinary policy as it relates to acts of uh, racial bias and prejudice and hateful behavior in acts? Yeah, absolutely. So as you probably read throughout KUOW's reporting and many other publications, there have been some really vile acts of restraint and isolation in our school district. I'm really proud to say that uh, in partnership with NAACP, Rita Green um, and Director Rankin, who represents District 1, if I'm not mistaken, we are bringing forth a policy very soon that is re-looking at how we utilize restraint and isolation in our system. Effectively, what this policy does is remove isolation as a practice and only allows restraint in the most extreme circumstances. Because what we know is that no amount of training is going to remove the evil that exists in people, right? 
And let's just be real. If you are putting a black boy in a cage for everybody to see, you are an evil person, you know, and let's not get it. Let's not get it twisted. You can't, no amount of professional development is going to take that out of somebody. So what that says to us as a system is we need to be prepared to remove the tools that people use to harm our children. And to me, that is isolation and restraint. Okay. That is one way that we reach a more safe learning environment for our black students. The other way is that I'm very proud to say that we have ended our relationship with SPD. Now, don't get me wrong. We, we definitely need some presence of the police department to mitigate disasters. But how often are disasters happening, right? What we really need to ask ourselves is when did it become common? When did it become common to have police officers in the schools? When did that become necessary? And not just high schools. We're talking about elementary schools. We're talking about middle schools. We're talking about babies. So when we're thinking about how are we going to dismantle the school to prison pipeline, it would be a really great place to start to remove the people that you see in prisons and schools. You know what I'm saying? Because there are opportunities for us to practice what we call de-escalation, talking through problems, teaching our children how to react, right? Because living in this city, living in any city, frankly, is stressful. There are so many competing variables for your attention, your time, and we do not do enough to talk to our children about their mental health. And so if we have all of these competing factors for our children's attention, and then we have a very oppressive system like school where there are police officers where our children go to learn, that doesn't yield the best outcomes, especially for human beings long-term. So what we really need to be focusing on, which is built into our strategic plan, is how are we creating safe and welcoming environments? And that means what are we doing to celebrate our students in their classrooms, through curriculum, through their culture, through every interaction that they have with the school district? Because when we do that, we are actually taking steps toward becoming an anti-racist institution because all of our environments are safe and welcoming to all people, especially our black students. Good. Okay. Um, restorative justice. Is it a viable program for address, for addressing racial conflicts between students in school? And, and if you would just give us an outline of what restorative justice is for those that don't know. Yeah, restorative justice is basically the idea of reconciliation when something adverse happens in a school, right? So like, if I've got student A is picking on student B, instead of giving student A a punishment, you're sitting down and you're talking through like, why is that unacceptable? And everybody has an opportunity to explain where they're coming from, and then healing happens after that. And quite frankly, I think that's the only way that we, we need to be proceeding with discipline in our schools, right? Because when you're thinking about it, Contrary to popular belief, what I know, especially as a second grade teacher, is that when I get a kindergartner or a first grader or a second grader, they're not coming in trying to be a bad student. They're not coming in trying to act up and cause trouble. They're coming in because they're in being a child, right? But our responses as educators and administrators, principals, everybody throughout our system, when we think about, let me back up, let me back up a little bit, right? So let me, let me, let me challenge this. The idea of school was created in the 1800s when most, when most people were trying to become what? Can anybody tell me? When public school was first created, what was the most common job in America that schools had to train their students to do? Anybody know? Factory no. worker. Huh. Walk in line, raise your hand, put your head down, do your work, don't talk, follow the rules, X, Y, and Z. That is where that system comes from. How many factories are we actually sending kids to today? Very few. So are we adequately, if our school system has not changed over the course of the last couple hundred years, if our school system has not changed, but our job market has, are we doing enough to prepare our students adequately for what is in front of them? And I think the answer is no. So when we're, when we're returning to the question, the real question is what are we doing to make sure that our system is keeping up and actually being responsive to what we know children are going to do, right? Because by the time, and then let me get back to the point. 
So as a second grade teacher, we have a kid that comes in, no kid is trying to act up, but based on their behaviors as normal children do and what we as adults have conditioned ourselves to believe a good student is, quiet, sits down, raises their hand, does their work, walks in line, we prescribe all of those traits through the praise and the punishments that we give children. And so by the time a kid has gotten to fifth grade or sixth grade or middle school, what have you, and they've already been labeled with all of those negative labels that we put on children for being children, then that is where those negative or adverse behaviors come from. We condition students to behave the way that they do. And the only way that we're ever gonna fix that is through restorative justice, because we need to teach kids how to talk to one another. And it's clear that we as adults don't know how to do it because we've had an endless amount of social unrest that people are just now paying attention to. <laughs> so that is where the focus has to be. We teach, and I'm gonna give you this one last example. We have to teach our children how to read. We have to teach our children how to do math. When we are teaching our children about nutrition, we teach that they have to eat healthy and we teach that they need to exercise. When was the last time you heard of somebody giving a lesson on mental health? When was the last time you heard somebody giving a lesson on how to adequately solve a problem with a friend? Doesn't happen very often. And there needs to be a renewed focus and commitment to these types of structures because that is how we build good citizens. We're not just building good students. We're not building good robots. We're not building A machines that are just there to read books and get grades. We need to be building the future electorate. We are building our future neighbors. And if we're not teaching them the social skills that are critical to having a functioning and understanding and tolerant society, then we are failing. And that is focus that school districts, not just Seattle, but across this country need to be taking. Um, what is taking so long to implement an ethnic studies program in our schools? Personality. I'm not convinced that people really want to do it, to be real with you. I think that we're, we're closer than we have been in a long time. But when we, when we have folks in our system who are doing the work necessary to make an anti-racist system, no system likes that. We want to say that we do, right? We want to put it on a piece of paper. We want to put it on the website. But when the rubber actually meets the road and folks start feeling uncomfortable, y'all know better than anybody else that equity only matters until it comes knocking at folks' doorsteps, right? I want equity for all kids in the system until it impacts my child's experience. So the reason that it has taken so long is because this is real progressive anti-racist work. And when you have real progressive anti-racist work with a leader like Tracy Castro Gill, who was the conceptualization, or excuse me, who was the um, program manager for ethnic studies at the district before events occurred and that no longer was the case, personality gets in the way. And that's incredibly unfortunate. But what, what I'm excited about moving forward is that under the leadership of Dr. Jones, who knows firsthand the impact of what ethnic studies can do for a child and what ethnic studies delivered correctly can do for a child. I believe that we're gonna get there. But again, this goes back to the first thing that we talked about. It's not just about what we're teaching our children, it's about who's teaching it and how they're teaching it. Because I can guarantee you, just like for, and I'll give you one, I'll, I'll leave with the story. I teach in federal way. I'm the, for the longest time, it's not the case anymore, but for like the first three years I was teaching at Rainier View Elementary, I was the only black teacher in my building servicing 450 black and Latino students. Every Friday I wore a Black Lives Matter t-shirt and the person across from me, just to spite me, wore a Blue Lives Matter t-shirt. Do you really want that person teaching your child ethnic studies? We have to go further because it's not just enough to put a textbook or really good curriculum in a teacher's hands. We need to figure out how are we holding folks accountable to this? How well are you teaching this? Are you doing the work to fully understand what delivering a cultural competency curriculum looks like? Because I can give anybody a, a wrench, 
But if they don't know how to use it, is it going to be useful? No. We need to make sure that we are going the full distance, because if we're serious about this, it's going to take more than what we've been talking about right now. And I believe strongly that, again, under the leadership of Dr. Jones, we're going to get there. But we're going to need y'all's help as a community to say clearly that this is a high priority for us. So much so that when we arrive at places where we get pushback, because what people will say is as soon as something hits their kid's desk that they don't agree with, we get hundreds of emails, hundreds of emails, right? There was a lesson that was taught last year about gender identity. And parents, as you can imagine, were not thrilled that their fifth and sixth graders were talking about how they identify in terms of their gender. Little do they know that, again, based on science, folks know who they are. Kids know who they are. They might not have words for it. They might not have the ability to articulate it. And there could be some extreme circumstances where they might be unsure. But having worked with hundreds of children in my life, kids know who they are. And we are doing them a disservice by giving them the tools to articulate who they are. Because if you can't say something, then you can't fully understand it. And if you don't fully understand it, there's no way that you can fully accept it. So imagine if you don't fully understand yourself. Imagine if you haven't been given the tools and the language necessary to be able to articulate who you are how can you accept yourself, let alone accept others that are like you? So we need to do a better job of making sure that when we get down into the trenches, into the classrooms, when instances like that pop up, we have to come together as a community and say, no, this is the direction that we need to head because it's going to make us a healthier society. Great. I have one more question, but I'll wait to ask that uh, till the end. Sure. What we'll do is... um, We'll just open it up. So if anyone has uh, any other uh, uh, questions that they'd like to ask, uh, now is the time. And again, I would ask that you would uh, stay muted and just raise your hand and then we'll call on you. So any questions? Okay, Tony. Uh, Thanks. Um, I'm going to go in a little different direction than what you directly talked about, Brandon. I've got a um, question that's um, related, of course, but a little different. So our group, I'm not sure how much you know about it. I know Joe gave you some of the information. Um, You know, we're mostly class of 1971, Roosevelt. And in that era, there was voluntary busing. And as you probably know, later on came mandatory busing. And then that all kind of fell apart in the late 90s and was abandoned. And you were talking about prices of houses in the city and all kinds of things that are affecting where people live. So now a school we went to, Roosevelt, is uh, has about 3% black students. And um, in our day, it wasn't much more than that. Um, And those are students who were in the busing program mostly. Now it's, you know, it's all by by district. So those 3% uh, live mostly or all in the Roosevelt district. Mm-hmm. But my, my question is about integrated education. So the reason this group exists is because we had that. As small as it was, we had it. And it meant something 50 years later when we got together last year. Mm-hmm. And you know, you were talking about students being prepared for the world, the world that exists now. And for me anyway, I think for a lot of us, that idea of integrated education is not defunct. It's really important. Um, It's the experience of going to school day to day with people who are different than you are and learning about them. Now, I just noted, I I think Rainier Beach has uh, 3% white students. Roosevelt has 3% black students. And I don't see how, I don't really have a way that can change. We're trying to think about it at rare, what we could do, Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe outside of the school day experience, but um, you know, black students, that 3% down at, uh, sorry, the, the large group down at Rainier Beach, they're going to encounter whites no matter what. They, I mean, they live in a, a white dominated society. I worry a lot about the kids at Roosevelt who aren't exposed to that and they live in a white world. Day yeah. to day. So do you have any thoughts about how to, how to breach that um, 
in uh, in some way here going forward? Yeah, absolutely. First off, thank you for that question. It was very insightful. Um, I think there are two parts, right? So there's two sides to every coin. And so my, my initial thought in hearing that question is thinking about who is centered there, right? Because if we're equally centering um, like the need for black students to grow up around white students and interact with white students with the need for white students to also have that experience for black students and other students of color, that's not necessarily anti-racist because it doesn't specifically center black students. So what I would challenge this group to do is to think about, okay, what do the black students need, right? And this again is going toward Dr. Kendi's teaching about how to be an anti-racist. If we are centering the needs of black students, then I believe strongly that high tides raise all ships. So what I would say is you're exactly right. We need to figure out how can we have an impact, maybe not necessarily on integrated education, because let's be real, we're not changing the history of redlining in this city, unfortunately. But what we can do is making sure that we are offering opportunities for these students to learn from one another in spaces that are race safe. And, and that is what I would say my suggestion would be is figuring out, okay, what is your goal, right? Because it can't just be to get black students and white students in the same room and say, okay, friendship, right? It has to be exactly like, what, what are we trying to get at? What is the problem that we're trying to tackle? And then make it targeted because you're not gonna be able to, you know, have touch points all throughout the city. And if you were, you would be stretched way too thin. Y'all all know this. But what I would say is just get really clear about what is it that y'all want to do, what y'all have the capacity to do, and then build in, or excuse me, build out from there. And I'm more than happy to come back and continue to engage with y'all and help think through like, well, how can the school district be a part of whatever it is y'all come up with? But I think that's the first step is how are we centering the needs of black students, right? Because it's true if we don't have, you know, opportunities for our students to grow up, live, work together, whatever then it doesn't give us the opportunity to see each other from an early age, which helps us build understanding of one another, right? But again, the focus has to be on black students for it to be explicitly anti-racist and in the name of equity. Okay, uh, next question. <clears throat> Someone have a question? I have a question. Yeah, um, uh, John? John Cat. Oh, John. I also uh, saw what, Alan had a question. It yeah, no, Al, Al, uh, I defer to Alan. Okay, but, go ahead. Uh, I really don't have a question. I just wanted to tell you there, Mr. Brandon Hersey, you're an inspiration. It's, oh, it's really you. a breath of fresh air to hear a voice like that coming from a, two generations away. Oh, and man. I want to let you know that I really appreciate what you do. You know, you're, you're fighting the good fight. And uh, you have a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, good things are going to be coming to you. You have good I karma. I love you, man. I appreciate, I love you too, man. I appreciate that. I needed that today. Thank you. Okay. Uh, John, you had a question? Yeah. Hey, um, Brandon, thank you so much for uh, your insights and your information. Um, and I'm blown away by your maturity. <laughs> I wish I could have been like you when I was age. <laughs> but um, also, I had a question. Um, interesting uh, statement that you made. Uh, well, first of all, let me preface. Um, I was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky. There we go. Or, or Louisville, as they call it. Louisville. And until I moved out to Seattle in ninth grade. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that you found more racism in Seattle than in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Yes, indeed. And in Hattiesburg, um, uh, you know, with family trips just around and about and all that. And so on my personal experience for, you know, uh, when I lived in Louisville, um, it was far more integrated and um dang you'd go out to a restaurant and everybody sitting around and just chatting up you know there was you know everybody was sharing tables and cross table talk and uh, 
a lot more interaction, maybe because there were more Blacks than there are in Seattle, I don't know. Um, but I really stick on this um, uh, thought that you had about racism in Seattle versus, quote, in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, because I think there's a stereotype there about the South. Sometimes people don't necessarily understand um, and, you know, if you have any further comments on that, um, it's something that's been of interest to me and something that I noticed when I moved out here in the uh, way back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for lifting that up. Thank yeah, you. Man. That up. Yeah. So, yes, I mean, it's, I mean, it's true. Y'all like, I think one of the big things is that folks out here think they got it figured out <laughs> because they live in super progressive Washington that there's no way that Seattle could be racist. And that's bull, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I think that from the perspective of coming as a Mississippian to this city, y'all don't, y'all don't really talk to one another. Y'all talk about each other, you know, but we very rarely do talking with one another and very rarely share space, you know? And I think largely, even more so than a racial construct, it's our, um, it's the wealth gap that exists here. Because I'll tell in Mississippi, I'll tell you to this day, my three best friends are all white Republicans, you know, and it's just like if I had met these dudes today, we probably wouldn't be able to have words, but we don't see we are so conditioned to see each other for all the labels that our society puts on one another that we don't see the human, the humans that we have in front of us. I think that the other piece that I just mentioned is that we think we got it figured out, you know. I think that Seattle feels as though because of where it is in comparison to everywhere else that there's no way that Seattle could be racist. And that's just not the case. And it's even more insidious because of the wealth disparity in this country. Because we're in Mississippi, the reason that in places like Louisville, the reason that you see people sharing space is because everybody's in the same income bracket. You know what I'm saying? We all ate at the same restaurants. It ain't that many places to go. <laughs> So you, it's going to be common for you to share space with one another and try to see each other for what it is, you know? Here, people keep to their neighborhoods, in their cliques, in their groups, very tightly. So much so that it took me a long time for me as a Black man to even find community here in Seattle, even amongst Black folks. Because we all, because there is so much trauma in this city and so much fighting going on that when you find people that you can trust, you cling and you, you, don't, you don't go outside of that. And I get that, but until we can start to erode some of that and actually get people to share space, not just be in the same space, but share space with one another. And y'all know the difference between those two things. So I'm not gonna go into it, but until we can really encourage that, and maybe that's an idea for, for what you're trying to do with black and white students, you know? What are you doing to foster for students to really share space with one another without it being because they are different races, right? What are we just doing to give kids more opportunities to be kids with other kids? You know what I'm saying? And I think through that, we, we really stand the opportunity to lift up what, you, what we've been talking about is that really we need to not just, you know, be prepared to pat ourselves on the back and say, we got this figured out because we don't. Okay, we've got a couple people with their hands raised. I'll go to Christina Rogers. I'll go to you first. Thanks, Joe. First of all, uh, Director Hersey, this is Christina Rogers. I'm the principal at Hi. Roosevelt. And I just, Thank I just you want to. Thank you so much for your service. Hey, I, I wish I could hug you right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I, I just I just want to validate um, as a school leader, like everything you've said resonates with me like a thousand percent. Um, and and as a white leader, I just I just want to own that I I am in total solidarity in. Um, in, in appreciating lifting up your words because I, I, I can't, I don't walk in your shoes, but I, as an ally, I just, I hear you and I see you. And I just, I just want to say that, I um, that I, I, I hear the words and I hear the stories from students in my school and they echo yours. And it's just really important to hear that from an adult and, um, and a school board member. So I just, I really want to just appreciate you. Um, oh my gosh. I also, I also just want to share that, um, I mean, from, from my vantage point, you know, 
as a white leader and an alumni of my high school, um, like many on the call, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of, I think, five high school principals in our district that, that are alumni of our schools. Wow. Um, that, that can be a blessing and a curse, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, um, you know, m- my work for at least the last several years has been, has been comp- 100% centered in, in trying to center our, our, our BIPOC students. Mm-hmm. My question to you and my wonder is about just the, like, you know, many of the things you've mentioned, the dynamics of the district and the dynamics of the segregated neighborhoods and, and the effects of redlining, even 50 years later and all those pieces in the real estate, like I don't see the demographics, the, it meaning the enrollment of Roosevelt High School in particular, because that's what we're talking about right now, right. changing anytime soon, right? If anything, it's going to get even tougher to buy a house in the Roosevelt Geo Zone. Um, and you know, one of the things I wonder about is, is like, you know, I, I, I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of. It is not the responsibility of the very few BIPOC students and BIPOC staff in our building to be educating and teaching and informing our large majority white staff, right, about how to do anti-racist work that's not okay with me on any level. And, and we've had to do a lot of dismantling to get to that place where we are in agreement. And I don't even know that we're in complete agreement about that, but that's my mantra, right? Mm-hmm. So when you have this white space, like, yeah. cause it is, it's a white space and it's historically a white space. It, it was built and it's maintained its institutional oppression, right? Like this, right. it just reeks of whiteness, right? And I, I, I can say that. Um, and I know that maybe creates some discomfort for folks, but it just is what it is, right? Like, how do, how do we, how do I as a school leader, how do we as a community, we, we have a lot of energy to, to, to interrupt that, right? But like, if, if it is such a white space, it's really hard for white people to call white. Sometimes we're even, even in our own, like, best interest right like well-meaning interest right Mm -hmm. we don't even know what we don't know right and and i'm talking we meaning white people right so like i i think that's a struggle for some of our some of our white space schools to really um to really be able to unpack all that whiteness when we don't have the representation and we don't want to call upon our, our BIPOC community members to be leading us in that work because it's not their job. But then there's like this void, right? Like, mm-hmm. because even with best interest, I have blind spots, I have bias, right. we all do, right? right? So I think that is a huge dilemma for a lot of our North End predominantly white schools who are predominantly led with white leaders, right? So in, in this, I'm acknowledging my own vulnerability as a white leader, right? I don't have all the answers. I'm not, I'm not like, you know, I, I, and I don't claim to ever, and I, but I'm open to feedback and I'm open to like learning and I'm open to, to reflecting on my own, you know, my, my own privilege and my own bias. Mm-hmm. And yet, right? So I just throw that out there because I think that is a really big, big dilemma. Right. Um, and I think that's a place where some, our, our whiter space schools probably need more support. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thanks for listening. And again, I just, I just want to appreciate you. If I could hug you through the screen, I would, I'm just really grateful Mm -hmm. to be here today with you and and hear your words. Cause I, I just, I'm, I'm blown away and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. Oh, thank you so much. Y'all have a great principal to hear a principal say what, um, here, what's your last name? What principal Rogers just said, that's rare. (laughs) That's real rare because she's right. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not the job because to be real with you, when you first asked your question, Anthony, one of the first things that uh, like popped into my mind was like, you know, yes, like we have all these, you know, super white space schools, but like, I don't know if integration is the answer unless we can do it really well. You know what I'm saying? Because like, that almost comes at the expense of the sanctity that some of our black space schools have built. And when you have an influx of trying to like, integrate, you're actually diluting culture in some spaces, right? Which is why we have to make sure that we're centering the needs of black students there to make sure that delusion doesn't happen. And really my, all I can say, Principal Rogers is keep doing what you're doing because we're all trying to figure it out. I sure as hell don't know the answer, but I think what we, what we need to, what helps me at least is putting into context the fact that 
we we are dealing with an entire millennia of human uh, our entire like species has always been founded on the construct of how we look and what race we are right and, it, and we are holding ourselves to an, a high task to dismantle that when it was developed generations ago right and all we can do all we can do is wake up each day and ask ourselves how we can do better we need to move faster don't get me wrong like this is going to be tough work y'all can see i got a head full of gray hair because i think about this all day but the reality is, is that we're building this airplane as we're flying it, right? And we need more leaders, more white leaders like Principal Rogers throughout our system, because only those folks who are going to be encouraging those conversations at every turn. And that's the only advice that I can give to get to the point. Y'all, I love talking. We could be here all night. But the best advice that I can give is just keep pushing people to talk about it. The other piece of that is that sooner or later, if they're not talking about it, or excuse me, if they're not uh, walking how they talk, we need to have some accountability in these evaluations. You know what I'm saying? Because really, I'm so tired of spending money on PD. Like I'm so sick of spending money on professional development for teachers to come in and not, and I'm not dogging teachers, I'm a teacher, but for specific teachers, we all know, y'all have seen folks during prof professional developments and trainings at your work, I'm sure. There are some folks who are engaged, there's some people who are shopping on Amazon. And I'm not trying to pay nobody to be teaching my babies when they could have been paying attention to the PD, but they were shopping on Amazon because they weren't trying to hear it. So I'm trying to figure out how do we work into evaluations of everybody, not just educators, principals, everybody. How are you living this? How are you actually making progress in our strategic plan in your classroom individually? And if you can't articulate how you're doing that, that needs to be noted on your evaluation. And if you do that enough, you got to go because we ain't got time for this, right? So those are the things that I think collectively, we as a society, we as, you know, groups like y'all, principals, educators can really put some pressure on the district is we need to come up with a definition of accountability and how far we're willing to go. Because we're just wasting money throwing problems, or excuse me, throwing money at PDs thinking that's gonna solve our problem. And we've proven that it doesn't. So at some phase, we need to figure out like, if you're not with it, then you need to go. OK, because we got 50,000 young people who are ready to get into these classrooms and do this work and make those salaries as compared to people who are just, you know, being here collecting a check to do what they've been doing for the past 20 years. You know what I'm saying? So that's where my mindset at is like, I'm not I'm not trying to spend no more money on PD. I'm trying to get folks up out of here. Okay, okay. Um, Lynn, you're and then after Lynn, I'll call on Maggie. I, I think you had your hand up. So, Lynn, go ahead. Lynn? You're muted. Thank you. Mr. Hersey, thank you so much. A young person like yourself joining the school board, I mean, taking on more work than you're already doing, and you're a breath of fresh air. And this kind of goes to the support of teachers. Well, for one thing, I live in West Hartford, Connecticut. I'm class of 71 at Roosevelt. I was a voluntary transfer student. And this is a very white community. And suddenly we have a black um, police chief, which is huge, right? And they're trying to recruit um, more black officers. And I told my son that who lives in Colorado, he has friends who graduated same year as him, 2004. And I said, Anthony, do you know of anyone? He said, mom, they don't pay any money in the police department, right? And, and then now I'm gonna segue to teaching. Same thing with teachers, they don't pay teachers. They are educating our future, right? If you wanna recruit folks, you have got to respect their education and their responsibility. And, um, and you know, it, even looking at COVID-19 and vaccines, they wanted teachers back in school. They wanted kids in school, which was very important, but the teachers had to get in line way back after a lot of folks before they could be vaccinated. Vaccinate the teachers, make them comfortable, allow them to do their job. So basically I'm saying we need to support teachers, salary, otherwise, and that would help to, to help to recruit more black teachers. So absolutely. teachers of color. Absolutely. Let me just say one thing. First off, Elder, thank you so much. I appreciate all of those words of affirmation. That means a lot, seriously. Um, but let me just say, let me put something into context for y'all because it's not, it's not just Seattle, it's everywhere. 
Seattle is bad, but let me let me put something in context. Y'all remember when I took that pay cut to come teach here? In my first year teaching, I was making more than my sister in Mississippi who had nine years of experience, two masters, a PhD, and an endless amount of clock hours on her on her transcript. And that's in my first year teaching here in Washington, right? So if it's bad here, you know that for the rest of the country, it's probably even worse. Now, I will say teachers in Washington are paid well, but our cost of living is ridiculous. And so what we really need, what, what I'm saying, and I'm, I'm, I really want people to hear me on this. It has, if we, we do not, <laughs> we do not really value education in this state. We don't. Because it is shown through how folks so quickly talked about our teachers union and our educators through the time that we were trying to figure out how to come back to school. When it push comes to shove, honestly, I'm telling you as a teacher first, I feel like the only reason that folks are trying to go back is because we could restart the economy and get people back to work. It wasn't, it wasn't focused on what were the public health outcomes that could have happened, right? And I, don't get me wrong, I, I'm happy that our schools are back in session. I believe that they needed to be at the time. I think that we did a good job of getting there, but we need groups like y'all to support us. <laughs> we need it because at the end of the day, if we do not fix this system, Y'all know I had no more people like me because I could go work for Amazon with my skill set, but that's not what's in my heart. And I can guarantee you that if I have black teachers over here, they're saying, you know what? No, nah, I'm good. I'm not going to be mad at them because I'm, I, I, sometimes I wake up and I'm like, for what, you know? Because not only am I fighting for educational justice for my students, I'm also fighting against racism thrown at me from the system. That's why we burn out quickly. Not to mention we can't afford to live here. So that's where we really need help from y'all. Advocacy to the legislature to improve the working conditions for educators. We need to get paid. If you, there is no other profession where you could have several advanced degrees, work 16, sometimes 16 hours a day for a lot of our educators, and get paid $50,000 a year. Where do they do that at? I, Cause I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it's laughable how little we value the work of education to think <laughs> that our children are being nurtured and educated by these people. We would want to invest a little bit more. But what that really shows is that, and what I honestly think it is, is that our state just can't afford it. We can't afford to pay teachers what they're worth because we go broke. But now that we have that shiny new capital gains tax, I really hope that we can get some, some, some <laughs> help in advocating that that money goes to where it needs to go to. Primarily students, but also teacher salaries. Okay, um, Maggie, did you have a question? Then we'll go to Carl. Um. Actually, I didn't have my hand up, but I'm gonna chime in anyway. I'm a, a retired 30 year teacher at Brandon. I, I feel your pain, but uh, hang in there because it's really worth it to drive away at the end of your career and go, that was a really good thing to do with my life. So yeah. way to go, fantastic. Looking forward to that day. I will say that um, the school district, a neighboring school district that I taught in was when I began there in the eighties was, um, the neighborhood that I taught in was middle class, lower middle class, almost all white. By mm -hmm. the time I left there 30 years later, it was one of the most diverse areas to teach in in the state. And somewhere in the middle, I'm getting back to your um, who is teaching ethnic studies curriculum and PD comment. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in the middle, I was having a parent conference with uh, one of uh, my families and uh, they were Native American family. And it just so happened at that time, I was teaching the required Native American unit, right? And the mother said to me in all seriousness and with respect, she said, I do not want you teaching that curriculum. Mm. What do you know about this? Mm. And this was the nineties and uh, I, I said, all right, I will not, I, I will, I will respect your, your request and 
of course I went and I thought about what is she saying? You know, what, what, what can I learn here? What are we doing? But it wasn't a period of time when it was talked about in the whole school district. But, but my point is, is that the PD is, is important because without it, people like me can't unlearn, relearn, add to their learning about those things that we were never taught sure. when we went to school or when we grew up. And so you, you have to have that training component, component and, and as a 68 year old, I've got a whole lot of learning to do still, yeah. right? Yeah. So I, I don't know how you do it. You're, you know, you're the, you're one of the directors, but yeah. um, it, it's, it's got to happen with, with all the people who, who have a lot more learning to do. I think I got it figured out if y'all want to hear the solution is just holding people accountable to what's in the PD. If I teach you how to do something, I okay. want to see you do it. <laughs> right. And if I'm offering a PD, I want to make sure that you're taking it. So I think that part of it is ensuring that we can track because we don't know what folks have taken what PD. Right. So we can't hold folks accountable to what we don't know that they did. So we need to track it first. But then once we've tracked it, again, going back to that evaluation piece, I'm all for PD as long as it's being used effectively. Because but what I'm not for is spending money that I could be spending on a child on somebody to sit through a PD and sit on Amazon, you feel me? So oh, that's I where I really, exactly. So as long, I think that we can do it if we can figure out a system to see how folks are actually utilizing the PD in their classrooms and holding them accountable to that. But I agree with you whole, wholly. There's always opportunities to learn and we need to be offering professional development, right? So forgive me if that wasn't clear. No, no, not at all, not at all. I, I was sort of echoing your your uh, question about, well, who is who is teaching? Right. Who is right. going to teach these ethnic studies or that history or or that philosophy or whatever that, you know? Exactly. Who, who is it and what do they really know? Yeah. I appreciate Thank you. That. Thank you. Um, Carl? Mr. Copeland to you. Uh, <laughs> so, um, Brandon, uh, outstanding uh, presentation. Um, we need about 10 of you. So we got to figure out a way how to get 10 of you down there uh, actively, you know, and you have, you have uh, maybe, maybe our panel, or our people don't understand that uh, the last census the uh, black population in the city of Seattle was 7%. Okay, now that includes kids and non-voters and 7% in this city. And, and it's like 8% for the whole state. So clearly my white compadres, friends, uh, past students, uh, we're, you're gonna have to step up. And, and to close that gap and get these Brandons in there, get his buddies in there uh, to make these changes in this short time that we're going to be on this earth. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, that, and that's real talk. Now, I, I, then I'm, I'm going to close this out. Uh, one thing that we have done with the Black histories and the studies and everything is we've diluted. We've diluted it. Just like, you know, you, they tell you put three parts water. Uh, you know, one part syrup, we've diluted it. We've diluted the thoughts of it, of, of doing ethnic set. We're still talking about this 50 years ago. We talked about having ethnic studies at, at Roosevelt and the Seattle School District 50 years ago, and we still don't have it. And so, and it's based, so my challenge is to, to uh, baggy everybody, love you all and everything, but there was 40 or 50 years after you, Roosevelt, and, and, go, and seeing all this stuff going on, love you for doing something now. We just really, we need to grab some people behind us and get them involved so we can get the Brandons and, and, and get these young guys in there because they're the ones that are gonna be, one, one they're gonna be pushing us in wheelchairs, but two, it'd be nice to, to, to go to the promised land as we say with a smile on our face right. because we've made a difference, a rare. And can I ask, well, so this is my opportunity and I'm going to tell you the truth. The only way that that's going to happen is if y'all donate to our campaigns, because I got to be real with you, young people running for elected office. I'm doing pretty good. I've raised a fair amount of money, but I, it's no secret that I've gotten to the places where I am because I'm light skin and my name is Brandon Kyle. Okay. 
There are many people. I am not special. I am not unique. There are many people just like me sitting in classrooms right now, yearning for an opportunity, but because of societal factors and because their life chances were different than mine, they're not getting them. So what I would just say, and I'm going to plug myself, but I'm going to plug every other young elected official who you identify with and you think is doing a good job. Please donate to our campaigns because we need it. Because we are going up against all of the societal factors that we talked about are facing our students in terms of resources. It's the same thing for us as well. So just going to put that plug out there. I will be more than happy to share my website link. But if y'all are really about it, we really need you to put your money where your mouth is and support us so that we can continue to do this work. Okay. Uh, Jane? At, at the risk of, of being Captain Obvious, why did you run for the school board in the first place? Yeah, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I am never satisfied. <laughs> Uh, I come from a, so my, my father was a Black Panther. My mother was incredibly politically active. And before she passed away, she always, as a government and civics teacher, she always used to tell us, I'm going to quit teaching. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to get my degree. I'm running for mayor. And unfortunately, that just wasn't in her path, you know, but that, that same stock was built into my two sisters and I, and I, I, I had teachers after my mother died who wrapped their arm around me right? So many from, from, so my mother passed away when I was 12 and every teacher that I had from the time that I was 12 to the time that I graduated college was personal friends with my mother. And remember before they, before she went on to glory, literally telling her that they were going to take care of us. And by us, I mean, me and my sisters and they did. And Y'all gonna have me crying on this call. That didn't have to happen. It just didn't have to happen. I'm not supposed to be sitting here, y'all. A black boy with Mississippi raised by a single father, poor as dirt, sitting here in one of the richest cities in the world on the Seattle school board. I would be, my mother would roll over in her grave if I wasn't doing everything I possibly could to give back to this community. Everything that I possibly could. Because that's to whom much is given, much is expected. And I have had wonderful life chances in my life. I'm very thankful. I'm very humbled and very blessed. But we all have a responsibility to do everything that we can to make our neighbors walk just a little bit easier. And so that's why I'm giving the better part of my 20s to this role. You know, I just can't stop. You know, I teach during the day. I school board at night and on the weekends. I'm the scoutmaster for Washington State's only African-American scout troop. Because I know firsthand that when you have mentors and people that care about children and who know how difficult it is out here, especially for our black babies who have had great life chances and opportunities set at their feet and who can pass that information on and who have the ability to work a system and change a system for the better, amazing things can happen. And so to that point, that's why I ran for the school board and that's why a ton of other people need to too, but we need your help. We need your support. You're on mute, Joe. Yeah, Les, you have your hand raised? Yeah, Brandon, you're doing tremendous work. I just got a, a quick question for you. Yes, I sir. want your perspective on what I call the South Lake, Texas turmoil, talking mm -hmm. about elections, mm -hmm. where voters there elected city and school board officials who oppose the plan and clearly they decided to vote against when the time comes any anti-racism diversity and inclusion curriculum curriculum that uh, is to be taught in the public schools mm -hmm. and the voters of that city voted in folks knowing that that is their objective and that's what they plan on doing mm -hmm. elected officials mm -hmm. and they're claiming they're speaking for the voters mm -hmm. So I didn't know if you had a perspective on what's happening down there uh, in yeah, South Lake, Texas. Hey, I'm in Quantico, Virginia, but that across the board, and you've talked about this kind of being a nationwide issue. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, it clearly is. So it really is. And you know, that's one of the one of the 
beautiful things about one of the opportunities I talked about earlier, the Truman Scholars, uh, the Truman Scholarship um, is a national scholarship that is awarded to college juniors, one from every state, one or two from every state um, who are interested in public service. And so for me, there's very few other people aside from maybe council members a la high um, at this age that are doing this type of work. And so that organization and my buddies, I actually just came back from a wedding of a friend of mine in that um, who's down in Arkansas, who's about to run for state legislature. Um, and the work that we are doing here is happening everywhere in small bits. But to your point, it's always again, until equity comes knocking at your door that everybody says they're down for it. But then when it comes to the ballot box, people are going to vote for what's in their best interest, right? And that's, and that's the work is to, is to try to convince and work that I really need y'all to do because <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm giving y'all homework, but I got enough on my plate so I could use a little help. It's talking with the folks in y'all's communities who are still here about what it looks like to actually support an anti-racist pro-black agenda from the school district. I, I cannot, and I, I just personally, again, like Principal Rogers said, it, it can't be our responsibility as elected officials of color to explain over and over again to white spaces why these things are important. Again, I got a head full of gray hair from doing that. This was not here a couple years ago. That's why we need help from the community, from y'all to have conversations in your circles, in your, and when you're in line at the grocery store, when you are having, you know, just lunch or coffee with a friend, when all that is okay again. Because that those are the people, the voters in this city, again, want, to, want you to believe that they are very progressive. But when it comes down to it, the ballot boxes have shown us time and time again that that might not always be the case, especially for our local elections, okay? And that's, that's really where the, where the rubber needs to meet the road. My perspective on that is that people have always done this. <laughs> Every time, you know, there's a progressive candidate that comes, they're like, yay until it gets to the point where it's gone a little too far, right? And so we've seen that here in Seattle too, okay? Especially on the school board. This, when folks start going a little bit too far, they either burn out and they don't run for reelection or they get challenged by, you know, a status quo candidate, we'll put it like that. And so that's, that's, that's the rub, right? And so that's where we could really use help is making sure that we are bringing people along and having conversations regularly when we find the opportunity to do so with our neighbors, because those are the folks who are going to be banking the decisions. Great. Um, yeah, um, Nadja. Yes, thank you. Brandon, I just want to say thank you very much. I've enjoyed your presentation. Um, it gives me hope. I have grandsons in the Seattle School District. Well, one, and the other one has gone to I think it's SAAS, S-A-A-S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, uh, but your, your talk about the, the Seattle public or the, the school system and, and preparing students for factory working and how they're conditioned and how the workforce and the industries have changed and the need, you know, the workforce, the need of the workforce has changed. It's interesting uh, because when I was rearing my two sons as a single mom, I kept saying, I've got to do something different. I've got to do something different because they're black men in America and I have to make sure that they are above the fray, right? Mm -hmm. And we were living in the central district at the time. I said, I just got to do something different. So I ended up sending them to private school. One went to St. T's, St. Therese, and then the other one went to Zion Preparatory Academy. And I just kept saying, if I don't do that, they're not going to get the support that they need. One, they're going to be misunderstood, you know, and misevaluated, and so on and so forth. So it worked out. They're both doing very, very well. But here's a story that happened the other day I encountered. I picked up my oldest grandson from his soccer game. So I picked him up over at his school. And the school is off of 12th and Union. Mm. Sass is off of 12th and Union, right there in the Seattle U area. You know, nice, nice area. It's right. like it would be fun to be in high school over there. It does. In the car. And so he and I are talking, you know, he calls me grandmother and 
and it was a soccer game and they won their soccer game and he was walking with a, a group of boys and I was watching him and kind of just seeing his dynamics. He got in the car and he said, hi, grandmother, you know, and it's just like a trip because he's getting older. So he, I'm driving him home and I live not even six blocks from Rainier View. Sure. And they don't live very far from me. They're off of 57th and um, Rainier. So right. you, kind of got, you know the area, right? Yeah. And so, and they be, before they moved there, he lived in Columbia City. There we go. Right off of Rainier. So okay. my son, the grandson is saying, wow, grandma, I'm, I've lived off of Rainier my whole life. <laughs> I'm thinking you're not even 15 yet. <laughs> so I said, well, do your friends, do you, you know, do you have good friends or fun friends? And he said, yeah, but they don't ever want to come out here. Hmm. I said, oh, I said, well, where, where, where do they live? He said, well, they live in Madison Park and they live in Madrona and they live in Lusha, you know, and he's going on. And I said, okay, but this is the counsel I gave him. I said, here's the deal. His name is Julian. I said, Julian, you will be in a better situation and a better place than they are because you're going to be willing to go to them and, and, and be able to navigate in their world and they're not willing to come to your neighborhood. I said, your true friends will accept you no matter where you are and where you live, right? Mm -hmm. And so he said, yeah, but, and I said, no, there's no but. It's going to be okay. I said, down the road, you will be able to navigate in their world, but they will not be able to navigate in your, in your world because they haven't taken the time to get to know you. I said, well, what happens when they get to your house? Well, they just think the house is beautiful. It's a brand new construction, right? right. And I said, oh, but what about you, the person? Well, yeah, yeah, they like me, but they just don't like walking to Rainier, uh, to, to uh, Safeway on Rainier. I'm saying, well, dude, don't even go down there because I don't go down there. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a it's, you know, I'm just teasing with them. And he said, no, but sometimes I just like to walk around. So I like the fact that you talked about a safe, race safe learning environment. So there's still, something's got to happen for there to be that crossover. If we're talking about integration, you know, at, it, as a it, voluntary racial transfer student, I did it. I did it. I went to the white environment, but I still look forward to the day when they come our way and whatever that way is, whatever that direction is, they come our way and they immerse themselves into being able to learn outside and, and integrate and, and, and hobnob, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. outside of their circle their world, their glass bubble, their glass right. house, whatever it is. So I just encourage my, my grandson. He'll be all right. He'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, he'll, he's going to be great. I mean, especially with a grandma like you. <laughs> I think that like, that is literally my childhood in a nutshell. And what the childhood, especially for every black student in Seattle is, is because quite frankly, we had to become bilingual, <laughs> right? Not only did we need to figure out how to navigate black spaces as people, but yeah. we got to figure out how to navigate white spaces too, right? And trust me, I have been, I do that pretty well. This is really how I got to a lot of places I've gotten. And the reason for that is, is because my parents knew that there was value in that, right? The question that I beg though is why? Why is there value in that? Why is there the expectation that as a black man, you're doing good when you live two childhoods and two lives and two identities? You know what I'm saying? Especially because like in Mississippi, I had a little bit more of a choice of if I wanted to do that or not. Kids don't have the choice to do that here in Seattle. Every black child, every brown child, regardless of their skin color, when they're walking around here, they're two people. And they have to have that at all times to be successful. And so when we are, when we are really talking about orienting and centering black students, how are we prioritizing the black experience, right? How are we giving opportunities for people to figure out how to navigate through our cultures and to, to be guests in our spaces, right? And that's the type of work and the type of mental capacity we have to have when we're developing policy. That's where it all begins is how do you think through problems, right? And it's those experiences like you talked about with your grandson that kind of inform how I know we need to be making sure that we are creating those safe, those race safe learning environments like we talked about. So thank you for that. Thank Your grandson you. sounds amazing. Thank you. He of is. Course. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was interesting. It got me thinking way back when uh, 
when I came out of uh, college and uh, went to work for corporate America, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And you, you talk about uh, having to speak two languages. Yep. <laughs> I, well, can, uh, English. <laughs> I can, I can relate to that. Um, one language uh, when you're at work, corporate world, and another language when you come home, you yep. know, when you're talking to, um, you're talking in the community, so to speak. But uh, yeah, I, I guess, uh, the, the thing I, I wanted Leah, to talk Leah's about. got a question real quick, too. Oh, okay. Uh, Leah, go ahead. Hi. Um, I really enjoy listening to you. Um, and I want to say, like, go to law school. But in any event, Maggie's um, statements, and hi, Maggie, raised some issues for me, as well as your statements about uh, moving forward from, say, preparation for factories for preparation for the new workplace right um and part of this conversation i'll be frank is is felt like we're we're stuck in 1968 kerner commission u.s is moving to two worlds one black and one white well yo when you look at seattle's population now um Mm -hmm. and i'm three generation it's gone from 12 percent down to seven percent but there's been a concomitant rise in Asian population. And I want to acknowledge first off that Asians are an incredibly diverse group, you know, Japanese, Chinese, Filipino, Indo-Chinese, um, oh. South Asians, uh, you know, all kinds of religions. Okay, so you got that. You've got a lot more Hispanic kids um, in the schools than, than when we went and we've got more Native Americans. Mm-hmm. And so what I haven't heard you talk about tonight is what do we do with the multicultural reality yeah. of, of the whole BIPOC population? Uh, and, and how do we form alliances? How do we, you know, how do you, how do you navigate policy for right. students and curriculum in that world? And also, you know, kind of acknowledge the problem of, of, of that Maggie rise, raises that if you've got mostly a white teaching population, Mm-hmm. And I've had, you know, and seen parents of color, even at the university level, like, you know, I only want black teachers teaching this stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like, you know, I'm not in the mood to do that. I do other stuff. So yeah. that's a long question. And I apologize, but no, don't apologize. I would love to dig into that. So yeah, so I'm going to I'm going to give you kind of my perspective as an individual and a scholar, like how I think about this as an academic. But then I'm also going to give you the reality of how we have to go about it. And so this is, this, is kind of, this is kind of how I make all decisions, right? So there is an organization called the Black Youth Project 100, and they teach that if we are able to free the Black queer woman, then by association, all other ethnic groups, gender groups, what have you, will be free. <laughs> so when we're thinking about targeting the most oppressed group in this country, which is black folks. Now let's not get it twisted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, right, we can agree. Then again, high tides raise all ships, right? But that does not excuse us from making sure that within our policies, we are being very clear about what are we doing to support native students? What are we doing to support Asian students and not just Asian students in general? But the problem though is, is that our education system doesn't know how to do that. And here's my issue. I take contention because I'm really trying to think through how to do this better with like terms like BIPOC right and this isn't something specific to what you were mentioning but just as an aside when we say things like BIPOC we're erasing the difference between black people indigenous people other people of color it makes it easier for white folks to think of us and when they think of us in a group as BIPOC then it makes it much more difficult to have good policy that addresses the needs of all those individual groups, right? So I think for the school district's perspective, we need to take a step back from that and say, what are we doing, right? Are we focusing on black students? Or do we need to make a policy that actually like supports, you know, X student group? So I think that the first step there is to eliminate like this, this group, right? These, these labels, these bubbles and start actually talking about what students need these things. The other piece to what you're talking about, I think is also, or at least another part of my decision-making is distilling down policy decisions to a very simple question. Does it advance racial equity or does it perpetuate racial inequity? And if we distill all decisions down, 
at the end of the day, we know what we need to do, right? So to get back to it, the reason why I, as a board director, focus solely on black students, because that's what our strategic plan says, black students and students furthest away from educational justice. And in order for us to actually realize that plan, we all need to be focused on that squarely, right? Because we know that a big system can't do it all at once. That doesn't excuse us for making sure that we are taking care of all of our children, regardless of their skin color, like you mentioned. And there are opportunities that we do that and we make sure that we, we build those supports in, in, in various places. But whenever I go to spaces like this, because our strategic plan is squarely focused on African-American boys and our black students, that's who I'm gonna be talking about, okay? And I get that question a lot and I don't want, it, I don't want it to get confused. I am a representative for every child in this district and I will fight equally as hard for our Latinx students, our Asian students, as much as our black students. But until we can get focused and serious about what we're trying to do and stay that way, then no group is going to get what they need. And again, if we are serious about targeted universalism and anti-racist approaches, the, the literature and the teaching is clear. We all need to be focused on black students. So I hear what you're saying and I agree wholeheartedly, but in these spaces, when we're having these conversations, that's my focus. Okay, uh, Brendan, I had uh, one last question here. Um, we're, uh, it's at 6.30 right now, but I, I think you kind of answered it, but I'll give you the opportunity to maybe add to it. And my last question was, how can RARE support you and the Seattle School District efforts in achieving uh, racial equity? Yeah, I mean, me specifically, again, I would love a campaign contribution <laughs> and if you can swing it. I know it's been a tough year for a lot of folks, but it really does go a long way. Um, to support the school district in general, vote for your next levy, continue to support Dr. Jones, and ensure that as you are having conversations out there in the ether uh, to advance racial equity, that you're just supporting the work that we're doing, right? We're not always going to get it right. No school district does. But I think that right now with the leadership that we have in Dr. Keisha Scarlett, Dr. Mia Williams, and Dr. Brent Jones, and the senior staff portion, the leadership we have on the board, Director Hampson, Director Rankin, and so many, and Director DeWolf especially, are, are, are squarely focused on the needs of all of our students of color, but especially our Black students and making a pro-Black agenda. This is the first time in a long time that we've had a really, uh, a really synergetic relationship with uh, between board and senior staff. And we need to capitalize on that because who knows how long that's gonna last. You know what I'm saying? So as we are pushing forward, you are going to see some really bold things happen in the next year or so. Just support us, especially in your conversations that you're having with your neighbors. It would really help because there are folks that, you know, as you can imagine are out there attacking us left and right. We just survived a recall effort because of, you know, all of the prog all of the progress that we've been making. They literally tried to recall us because we're rebuilding Rainier Beach High School and giving those kids down there the school that they deserve. You know what I'm saying? Obviously it got thrown out, but that's that. those are the types of attempts that folks are waging against the school board and that kind of stuff happens. Usually when you got a recall effort against your school board, especially here in Seattle, it probably means that they're doing something right in the name of racial equity. So I just want folks to know that as we are pushing forward, we are, we are resolute in the fact that we are trying to make this a better district for the folks that look like me, for our Asian students, regardless of what country their origin might be, our Latinx students, everyone who needs that attention, we are squarely focused. But again, if we can figure out how are we going to support the most marginalized students in our district first, then that is going to effectively make it just a little bit better for everybody else at the same time. So we could really use your support in helping us get there and having those conversations out in your individual communities. Great. And, uh, and again, um, I tell you, Brendan, this has been uh, outstanding. Oh, thank you, are you. A, uh, you are a special, special uh, person and only oh 29 God. years old. I tell you, um, you're, you're, you're a blessing. Oh and God. all I can say is uh, your mom would be very proud of you and you'll know, just keep being the person that you are. You, for an old man like me, you're inspiration, knowing that you know someone as young as you are uh, is committed to the things that need to get done um, to make it better for kids coming up behind us and so forth. But uh, again, I, I thank you for, for your time and um, unpaid time. <laughs> thank you for your time and appreciate it. Tony, anything you wanna add in closing? 
Well, likewise, um, you know, to talk about such difficult stuff as you did and to still project the uh, energy and can do optimism about it. I guess optimism is the right word. I think, yeah. you know, if we, if we apply ourselves and um, that means a lot. And uh, also your offer to come back to us or for us to maybe run something by it at some point as we're developing these ideas, invaluable if we can do that. Absolutely. And I like the combination. We learned a lot, but we, and we also learned about some stuff we can do. And uh, this group's about doing stuff, talking and doing stuff. So great contribution. Thanks very much again for your time. We'll be, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, Brent, Brent, hey, real quick. Brent, real quick. Yes, yes, I'm still here. Uh, weren't you at the Esquire Club? Oh, yeah. So yeah. I did. Yeah, I still need to get my... Oh, hey, uh, folks, he came and spoke at the Esquire Club to about 25 of us and just blew us away like we've been blown away right now. Oh my gosh. This young, this young man is, he, uh, he, I mean, he had these old farts at the Esquire club, just like an owl to see this gifted young man walk through that institution and actually teach us something. Oh man. Appreciate you, man. Love Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank Great. you. Love yeah. you too, brother. I appreciate you. Uh, okay. All right. All right, I dropped my link in the chat. So if you want to learn more about our campaign, you can click that. Thank you for your time. And I look forward to the next opportunity. Yeah, and uh, I, I know a lot of people, Brenda, will be, will be supporting you. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate that. Y'all take yeah. care and enjoy the sunshine, all right? Okay. All right, bye-bye. Okay. Hey. okay. And there they go, Lynn, Wendy, John, Maggie, Robin, Keith. I bet you who that is. Okay. And Carl, the old fart. I just found out that I would have been sold for $1,280 today as a slave. So what do you what do you think, Carl? I mean, so <laughs> what I'm saying, a younger guy like you and Keith and those guys, y'all would have got fourteen hundred. Yeah. Okay. So, but I could have got another two hundred and forty dollars because I would have been running YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not everyone thinks like you, Carl. That's what makes you special. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Hey, all right, Keith Thompson, good seeing you. Take care, Keith. I'm not sure who the other person is. Good seeing you guys, too. All right. Says Nurse all Lynn. Right. Lynn. That's not Lynn. Well, it says Nurse Lynn up there. Yeah, but it's not Lynn Hayes. I'm not sure who it is. Who is that? Nurse Lynn, who are you? I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, good night. All right.